Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation on securing Git repositories with GitHub. My name is Aditya. I'm a PhD student at New York University. Uh, I'm a maintainer of the Intoto project over at the CNCF uh, and GitHub here in the OpenSSF sandbox. And I'm a contributor to a bunch of software supply chain security related efforts, such as the Tuft project and uh, you know, uh, tax security supply chain working group at the CNCF and you know, positive results of specification. All right, and hello, uh, my name is Billy Lynch. I'm a staff software engineer over at ChainGuard, uh, and I'm also a maintainer of a bunch of open source projects, uh, Git Tough that we're here to talk about today, uh, but also Six Stories Git Sign project, as well as Tecton and Tecton Chains in particular. Um, yeah, so today we're here to talk about uh, Git source provenance, a uh, bunch of different things. Uh, but first I wanna talk about a little bit of the current state of the world. So we've been here all week. Uh, if you've been around the software supply chain track, you've probably seen a bunch of these different tools. Uh, everything from generating provenance and attestations to how do we query it, how do we f discover the, this type of metadata, how do we write policy and evaluate these types of things. Um, but one thing that you might notice is a lot of this tends to be very directed towards artifacts, and in particular, like runtime artifacts. So images, packages, stuff like that. Uh, so this graph is taken from the Salsa site, and it sort of lays out a bunch of the, the potential threats and you know, where we're sort of concerned about uh, for our software supply chain. But we don't often talk about sort of the very, very first part of this. Uh, how do we start securing our source, uh, our source and our source code and our source repositories, right? We talk about package, repository, uh, package repositories, image repositories, but what about source repositories? So source repositories are very, very important, uh, and if not like one of the most important pieces of our software supply chain, right? Because it's where everything originates. Uh, this is where you know, the images come, have some sort of source code that they come from. Uh, but more and more frequently, we're seeing within like CI CD pipelines, uh, you pull artifacts that you run as part of your CI configuration directly from source code repositories. So a compromise in your repository might then snowball into a compromise of your artifact repository or other downstream effects. Uh, so it's equally as important to protect and, and to take all those same protection mechanisms. So, whenever we talk about how do we want to secure repositories, the first thing that should come to mind is policies. Uh, policies are not necessarily a one-size-fit-all solution. Not every single project will need the same policy. Uh, but the first thing we need to figure out is how do we define these? So, some common policies you might think about for source code and source repositories, uh, the most obvious one, branch protection, right? We wanna make sure that before anything gets merged into main, uh, has it passed CI? Has it been reviewed? Um, we might also want to have similar policies for tags. So branches or tags, they're both refs within Git, uh, but tags we might want to have additional policies that we put on because those might correspond to releases and things that we think people are more likely to, to consume. So for example, for merging into main, you may want to say, hey, this needs to be signed off by you know, some on the developer team, but for a tag, you might want to have additional policies that say, hey, like this needs to be signed by our CI pipeline, or this needs to be signed off by someone on the release team, an SRE team, something like that. And so we might end up having different policies for different situations. Uh, finally, you might even have a folder level policy. So you're seeing this more often with code owners. Uh, so GitHub has a code owners feature. A um, few other forges have similar features. Uh, so say if your company has a monorepo, you might want to ensure that certain teams or certain people approve and review changes to certain parts of your repository. And you might want to slice and dice to like a very fine grain level of who's allowed to approve where. So what does Git give us today? Um, so Git in particular. So Git is fairly simple, right? So we have checksums, we have um, SHA-1s for all objects that we have. That's for blobs, for trees, which are basically folders, uh, as well as the commit objects and tags objects themselves. So we do have some amount of integrity checks. If someone modifies the history, we can see, oh, that changed the checksum. Uh, we can go say, hey, something changed uh, in this history. Um, and we can ensure that we're looking at the same point. 
Uh, we're not going to go into SHA-1 versus SHA-256 debates here, uh, but you know, it is something to keep in mind. Um, Git also does have support for commit signing and tag signing. So you can associate authenticated metadata to individual commits and individual tags as well. However, you know, in practice, there's more that we do when we, when we interact with Git repositories. Um, so many forges, so forges are basically code hosting providers, so think your GitHub, your GitLabs. Um, you often interact with Git repositories with things like pull requests. But pull requests are actually not a concept in Git itself. It's something that's built on top of Git. GitHub has pull requests, GitLab has merge requests, Garrett has changes. Um, you might even have, if you look like Linux kernel development, I believe they're still using mailing lists and patches that they use to coordinate changes. So there's all these different flows for managing code reviews. Um, and that kind of breaks some of the distributed nature of distributed version control. Uh, and sometimes it makes it a little bit harder to make sure that we're following all these policies. Uh, to their credit, GitHub and GitLab and a lot of these forges do have security features that they are uh, building in. So things like required uh, CI checks, uh, required uh, protected branches. Uh, but again, like those are forge specific features and they're not actually part of the repository, they're features built on top of the repository. So the question then becomes, all right, is that enough? And for, as like most things, you know, even though we might trust these providers, uh, we still wanna be able to verify these claims after the fact, especially when it comes to security metadata. Uh, you know, it's very nice to be able to say, hey, you know, this thing, you know, if we have a commit, we can associate it with a pull request, but how do we actually know that that pull request has gone through all the checks? And more importantly, how do we know six months down the line, a year down the line, how can we look back and verify and ensure that all of those checks have happened in the past? Sometimes that can be very difficult, especially when you think of like code owners, for example. Uh, sometimes a code owner's file references a GitHub team. GitHub teams, unless you're part of that org, can sometimes be very opaque and knowing how those things change over time can actually be very, very difficult. So we lose some of that metadata sometimes uh, that would be very useful to be able to verify, like, was this change approved by the right person at that right time? So ideally, we want to get to a state where uh, anyone can verify this metadata, any consumer of the Git repository, whether you're a member of that work or not. And so taking a step back, you know, a few months ago, uh, we were thinking about, okay, so what sort of security properties do we care about? Uh, or might people care about when consuming Git repositories? So uh, we're gonna go through some of these here, but for example, enable verification by any, any party. So regardless of whether you're a maintainer or not, you should be able to pull a repository, verify that everything checks out, um, and great, yeah, fantastic. Uh, we wanna be able to verify the state of any previous state of the repository. Um, it shouldn't just be what is the latest. We should be able to go back even to the first commit, ideally. Um, key distribution, hard problem. Um, if you ever go, there's some six door talks that go into this as well, um, and we'll go into some of the tough aspects. Uh, key distribution, very hard problem. How do you make sure that you're getting the right keys? How do you know that they belong to the right people? How do you know what keys to check against for this authenticated data? Um, there's a lot that you need to think about and to get right in order to do it securely. How do we rotate uh, and revoke keys, right? Keys can get leaked, it happens, we need to be able to respond to that, and more importantly, we need to be able to know when to no longer trust an old key and how to find the new key. Uh, separation of duties, so that we went into this before, uh, so you might wanna have different policies for different things, you might have uh, more strict policies for, say, main uh, versus looser policies for feature branches. You might have even stricter policies for release branches and tags. Uh, Multi-party authorization. So this comes up a lot when, uh, with salsa discussions, uh, but this is generally like a good best practice. Uh, one of the things we want to be very mindful of is uh, we don't want any single actor to be able to uniformly like override security policies for the repository. Uh, so this is sort of your typical insider risk. Uh, even if you have, say, owner on uh, the repository, it would be problematic if you went in, you know, disabled all the security checks, did whatever you wanted, force push, did whatever, re-enabled the security checks, 
um, you know, that might be really hard to detect because unless you're looking at that very particular point in time, you may not be able to catch that, oh, oops, we, you know, remove branch protections or, or do whatever else. Uh, so we want to make sure that, you know, whenever a security policy changes, multiple, multiple people sign off on it. So even if one account is compromised, it's harder to compromise the entire repository. Uh, and then finally, uh, Git has been around for a long, long time. Um, so anything that we do, anything that we add, uh, we need to make sure is backwards compatible. So this means, um, you know, if someone is using sort of more security tools on top of an existing repo, uh, that shouldn't break the workflows of everyone else using that repo. And similarly, um, if, you know, before you were using a Git repo uh, and then you want to adopt some of these stricter security policies, we want to make sure that we can do that in an incremental way without having to, you know, completely annihilate the history of the repo and all the metadata that has already been associated with it. And so that sort of brought us to the idea of Git Tough, and I will now hand it off. Okay. Um, so let me dive right in. Um, so it's in the name. Uh, it's Get, uh, the update framework is a uh, project over the CNCF, which is focused on how you securely distribute artifacts from usually like a package repository or uh, a container image registry. Uh, but in solving the problem of you know, securely distributing artifacts, it gets a lot of things pretty right in context of like handling key distribution and rotation and revocation. It also has the very powerful semantic of the ability to delegate trust from one set of people to another set of people without you know, them having to share keys or things like that. And the other thing that I want to give a little bit of background about as far as GitHub is concerned is this uh, idea of a reference state log. Uh, anytime you want to enforce policy on what's happening anywhere, right? you need activity that you enforce that policy against. And in Git, your, for example, your commit graph for your main branch isn't really your activity log. The true activity log is how that branch changes over time, right? Oh, the main branch was at a particular commit yesterday, but you know we merged something into it today and it's changed. And you really wanna be able to enforce policies on that action of updating the reference. And to do so, uh, we keep track in, the Git, uh, in, in GitHub, within the repository, uh, reference state log that gets uh, updated as, uh, e as different references in the repository change. It's, it's very similar to a Git ref log if any of you have ever used it on you know, your local copies of repositories, but uh, A, it is actually uh, embedded in the repository and shared across all the different people contributing to the repository, and B, it's authenticated using signatures on each individual entry. Um, so putting these two things together, uh, we store all of this in custom Git references within the repository. And we've covered out a little namespace for ourselves with ref slash git tough. The our cell, uh, every time a reference uh, state changes within the repository, we add a new entry to the our cell. And uh, the policy metadata, uh, which is very tough like, um, is stored in a separate namespace, which is also tracked by the our cell. So the our cell gives us information of, hey, the main branch went from commit A to commit B, but also oh, uh, the owners of the repository updated the policy that's applicable to the repository from you know, that point of time onwards. So um, you know, if, if I have uh, some, some, you know, some Git repository and I'm using Git Tough and I contribute a new commit to a branch and I'm about to push this out to our Git server so that you know, my collaborators can also get it, right? And in, while doing that, I create that entry in the, uh, in the reference state log, which is, again, quite simple. It says, hey, the branch that's being changed and what it now currently points to. I sign the RSL entry with my key. I push it up. I push both of them up uh, to the Git server. And uh, because we're using the Git object store to store the extra metadata and we're using Git custom references, uh, it doesn't matter if the Git server is aware of GitHub or not because they just, it, as far as the Git server is concerned, it's getting pushes to two different namespaces, uh, two different references in the repository. If the Git server is uh, uh, GitHub enabled, it can you know, perform GitHub verification on that change we just made. And uh, this, this is great because now you, you also have the ability to reject changes from you know, making their way to other clients and all of that. Uh, but if not, 
say another get def enable client pulls it in, uh, they get you know the change on the branch as well as the signed statement of hey I made this change to that branch uh, that they can then verify. Um, and Billy talked a few minutes ago about incremental adoption. So if you've got Git only users interacting with the repository, they're just going to see that change to the main branch. They're just going to be completely unaware of the GitHub specific metadata. So uh, this is a slightly condensed version of GitHub policy that's uh, enabled on one of our demo repositories. Uh, if any of you have worked with Tuff in the past, a lot of things are going to look somewhat familiar. Um, it's, th this, this has basically one rule that says, hey, this, this rule protects the main branch of the repository and every push to the main branch needs to come from me. That's you know, my uh, uh, git sign identity uh, authenticated via GitHub. Um, another component we're plugged in to GitHub is support for intro attestations. We make use of them in a couple of different ways. Um, I added this slide about 30 minutes before this talk and then walked in to see Michael give a uh, uh, introduction to the project as well. But an intro attestation is an authenticated piece of metadata about your software and it allows you to make certain claims about you know, different attributes about that artifact and things like that. Um, and in the past week, you've probably heard this in context of salsa build provenance and other things quite a bit. Um, we use it for a lot of the multi-party authorization uh, aspects of GitHub, for example, uh, because uh, while a Git commit can be signed, it can only be signed meaningfully by a single person uh, without, well, yeah. So uh, for, for those, to record those additional authorizations, we just put, use attestations uh, to make that happen. Um, attestations are also, of course, super useful for answering a bunch of other questions. With this a really tight coupling with uh, between our source uh, repositories and you know CI based workflows and uh, to kind of close that loop about answering the questions of hey I made this change to my branch and I want to know that the CI picked it up ran tests etc it's 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 really great to be able to set those kinds of policies as well this is a little hypothetical at this point um, we're also discussing how we can authenticate users who do not use GitHub or who do not uh, you know sign RSL entries like when they make a push uh, using alternative mechanisms that we, th we then record as an attestation as evidence of having authenticated them. Um, and a really cool thing that we want to build out soon is supporting the generation of verification summaries for GitHub. So when I perform a GitHub verification, I want to be able to attest to that saying, hey, yeah, I verified the policies in the repository. They all check out. Here's my signed statement saying so. And that allows it to kind of be plugged into other parts of our supply chain in those policies. So like step one in your uh, overall policy becomes, hey, give me my source code with like the statement from GitHub verification. Step two is build off that source code where we create salts of provenance and we can kind of chain all of those along, which is also a really core intuitive concept. So, um, when I have a GitHub enabled repository, uh, in, in the typical sense, we kind of you know, assume that uh, we're in a good state and like policies have been verified up until that point. I receive a bunch of new changes. The GitHub client goes, inspects each one and ensures that they meet policy. And if it finds something that violates policy, uh, we're building in mechanisms. Um, so like this is built in, but like we've got a bunch of UX improvements we need to make. But there are, there are ways for a GitHub user to say, hey, that was a bad push that violated policy. So I'm going to revoke that and I'm going to reset the state of whichever branch was affected um, and so that the repository returns to a good state again. Um, with that, I'm going to dive into a quick local demo. Okay, so what we have here is a very simple test repository. Um, there's been a single commit so far. Um, and we can look at what the uh, RSL actually looks like, which is, again, just a few different pushes that, you know, like, hey, the main branches have that commit, a few things that happened before. You can see that the, you know, the, the, that main commit first landed on the feature branch was, uh, and so on. You can also see that the policy uh, that's applicable in the repository is, uh, is, is recorded here. We can 
take a look at the policy itself. Um, so we have a main branch protection rule, and it says that we require at least two valid signatures from those two keys uh, before you know, GitHub verification passes um, in it for, for, that, for a push to that branch. So let's make a new change. Uh, we're going to just modify the readme a bit. We're going to get add that. Cool. Um, and now, so for the purposes of the demo, we're just keeping everything local, but a lot of the times when you see something being recorded into the RSL, it really is, you know, this would happen when you're actually like getting ready to make that push and make that available to other people. Uh, so we're gonna record what just happened to the readme in the RSL and here, uh, I'm gonna, so I've made this, I've pushed this up, you know, and, and now this is all happening using Billy's identity, and uh, this is where I step in with my key to say, hey, yeah, I approve this change, and, and so on, but again, all of this is happening uh, uh, locally, but yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna sign this with... Uh, Try, trying to do a demo for two identities on one computer is difficult, so yeah. bear with us. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah. Uh, and so all I'm really saying here is, hey, uh, using my other identity, of my key, I, I say that updating the main branch using whatever the current state of the update readme branch is fine with me. So I'm gonna do that. And you can see the attestation itself. Oh, sorry, the reference state log itself. Um, you can see that there was an update to the attestations namespace, and you can pull up the attestations. So yeah, like earlier we said, hey, the main branch doesn't exist yet, but let's make it go to that new thing. And now we're saying, take it from that thing to the next thing. So we're back and you know, Billy has got my approval. So he's actually gonna go and merge uh, the update readme branch. And uh, so that, that's where his second signature comes from. And once again, this is getting recorded in the RSL as it gets pushed up. And we can take a look at what it looks like. Cool, so verification passes because we had two signatures there. So what happens if uh, we just go for it, uh, you know, just, just have a single signature in there, do not meet that minimum two required signatures rule, uh, just push directly to uh, the main branch. To record that in the commit. Uh, push and let's see what happens. Verifying git namespace policies fail because, you know, unauthorized signature, we should actually update the error message a bit more to be more uh, clear that what really happened was we're missing at least one valid signature. But yeah, uh, that the other way. Sorry, also new computer to me. Um, so we've, we've also like gotten a couple other versions of this. We were playing around with maybe trying to do, you know, two laptop based demo here and in, in the interest of like actually getting it to, uh, to work in the time available for a talk and just- Always yeah, have backup slides. Always have backup slides. Uh, so uh, there's another repository up there called ossna-demo where you know, if you clone it, you're gonna see that there's an unauthorized signature. It's basically the same thing. Uh, it's missing one, but uh, this is the rollback mechanism that I was talking about earlier where um, you, you kind of, you annotate the RSL saying, hey, let's skip that last push that was invalid and also make changes to the main branch to revert that commit and record that again and basically make verification happy again. Um, this is basically the workflow 
uh, I showed off without the actual pushes and pulls. Uh, you know, you check out a branch, get the authorization after pushing it up, and then uh, uh, merge, merge, uh, merge into the main branch and sign it the right way. You have two signatures and GitHub's happy. Uh, we also included a GitHub action for that flow, and you can see that the GitHub action that checked out the repository and performed GitHub verification uh, complained when we pushed straight to main without that additional signature. Then we fixed it, verification's happy, and then we did it the right way by checking out a branch, getting multiple signatures, and merging it in. Um, with that, I'm gonna actually hand it off to Billy again. All right, uh, yeah, so what's next? So GitHub is an actively developing project. Uh, we've only just joined the OpenSSF sandbox, uh, so a lot of stuff is still in flight. Um, even you probably saw in the demo, some of this is a little rough. You have to do multiple pushes. Uh, it's all stuff that we want to focus on. So UX improvements, uh, we want to, we've, we've been really focusing on the mechanics of like the cryptography. That's something that we want to make sure that we get right. Uh, but we do want to make it easy so that you don't have to think about like, oh, do we have, to, like what refs do we have to push? There's all these multiple refs that we have to worry about. Ideally, that should just be one command. And ideally, that should have command compatibility with existing Git commands. So you don't really have to think about it. So things that we're looking at are things like, um, uh, repository hooks that we can just automate it for you so you can just use your normal git workflow and it just does all the git stuff stuff under the hood and you don't have to ever think about it which is great uh, the other thing that we're looking into is signed pushes because we think there's a lot of opportunity there especially with the uh, the ref state log it acts very similarly so we want to make sure that we're on top of that um, not the top priority for us because no forge supports it yet, uh, but it is something that we want to uh, look into and, and uh, work on. Uh, and then finally, CI CD automation. Uh, so we mentioned this a little bit before. Uh, for users that aren't, uh, so ideally, signing stuff locally with your own key is probably the most secure that you, uh, that you can do, right? Because then you don't have any sort of third party dependency that you have to worry about. Uh, but we do recognize that like, there is going to be sort of a long tail adoption for some of these things just because it is a new tool. Uh, so one of the things that we're thinking about is automating a lot of this. So it, say if we have an observer that can attest to things on behalf of users, that may not be the most secure, but there's, there's a spectrum here of like, hey, we can start uh, annotating this supply chain metadata, start recording, hey, this was reviewed by these people, uh, do that on behalf as automation. And uh, what's really nice is SigStore and the keyless signing flows uh, make this re really, really easy to do. So that's something we're looking into as well. Um, how to reach us. So uh, we're involved in the OpenSSF. Uh, so we have meetings online every month. Um, we have a Git Tough channel on the OpenSSF Slack uh, mailing list, and you can find our repo here at Git Tough. Uh, we also want to give a big shout out to all of our contributors that have helped us along the way. Um, Justin, Reza, uh, Neil, and Patrick, uh, your help is greatly appreciated. And everyone else who helped us along the way with uh, OpenSSF as well. So yeah, that's all we have. Uh, we are happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna no. bring it back. Yeah. Um, so one of the one of the things that we have uh, with the Kubernetes CI, so the SP Kubernetes project, is it costs us between a hundred and two hundred thousand a month just to run CI jobs. It's the dream one day to be able to have developers run them locally and submit proof of that being run, so we don't have to run it on our cloud infrastructure to save on costs. How, does this lead towards that in some magical way? How do we get there? Um, so that's, okay, first I'm going to repeat that back. Uh, the question was, uh, there's a lot of centralization of a lot of tasks that get run on like CI, which can be quite expensive. And if there's a mechanism to move some of that more towards the developers and, and just have proof that it was like, like you know, that, that action was taken without, you know, having all, have to bear all of those costs of running them centrally. Did I capture that right? All right. Um, it is actually something we've been talking about uh, in the context of more like, oh, um, Git has this feature, for example, of Git hooks, where you can kind of instruct on the client side what needs to happen, but there isn't a lot of management around it. And in the context of like, oh, how do we ensure that every GitHub user for this repository has 
uh, this set of hooks installed and wh where it runs, how can we sandbox it, and how do we collect proof, probably as in total attestations, that when they actually perform an action, that they didn't just upload our, yeah, that's, that's something we've been talking about, but it's super early days. It's, it's really nice because we use a lot of tough semantics under the hood, and, and like, uh, like the, the, that, that also kind of handles the problem of, hey, we need to distribute this pieces of code that need to be run in uh, developer machines or whatever, and we want to have some set of guarantees about what could distribute it and what could run. So I would say there, um, yes and no. <laughs> um, so the, the problem is uh, you could use it for that, but the problem is you would need to trust the identities that are creating those attestations, right? Um, so if you have a policy that says, you know, we trust these maintainers and they're going to do the right thing, you could do that. In practice, would you want to do that? Probably not. However, uh, I know the Kubernetes structure is a little bit unique, so something that you could do that might be a happy medium here is, uh, I know there's like the, the mega mono repo and then there's like the sub sick repos. What you could do is you could have trust policies that say like, we will trust things in the sub repos as placeholders for things in the mono repo, and you can create that trust identity that way. So you could fragment some of it, but would you really want to trust for merging into main, like my local development machine said this was okay, so therefore just merge it? Probably not, but yeah. The, 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 the more important thing is like you have, once you have the policy and you have the tools to make that policy, you can choose which identities you trust and where those things come from, and then you can make those determinations on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just like elaborate a little more on the idea of repository hooks. So I mean, I know you say merge into general, but you have to run the git attestation for the container. So I was wondering if you were able to envision that eventually it would be possible for a one to four to now create like a project where they trusted the maintainers already and don't really have to change like their workflow too much. Would it be possible to like maybe like you know, maybe I would say envision this? Yeah, so uh, to repeat the question, are we envisioning using repository hooks to make it easier to get people to onboard to, to using GitHub and their tools? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it just hasn't been the top priority just because we want to get the mechanics right first. Uh, any automation and like, you know, sort of UX features we do in repository hooks would just be doing the same things. It would just be doing it under the hook, uh, under the hood. Uh, and then the other thing, there's, there's two sets of client hooks that we want to do. So there's like the client side uh, repository hooks that would help the, okay, when I make this push, like do all the, all the RSL stuff, but then there's also server side hooks that we also want to look into, um, which doesn't really help if you're running on GitHub, but it does serve as a good proof of concept of can we start rejecting pushes if they don't meet those security policies as well. So both sides of that we want to play around with in terms of hooks, but yeah, like, we, we recognize that the, the user experience at the moment is a little rough, um, but yeah, we have to start here and build upon it. Uh, but yeah, that is exactly the direction we want to go in. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I think that kind of also, oh, yeah, good, good point. Uh, so, the question was uh, about, you know, on the server side hooks, how, how does that tie into with like contributions from untrusted maintainers and uh, with, with like attestations of, of those actions performed by untrusted users by trusted users? Uh, did I miss some of that? Or? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there are a few things in parallel that, that we want to explore. Um, if you can control the ability to set repository side hooks, uh, like one, one, uh, one thing we want to build out, for example, is support for signed pushes, where the repository receives the signed push certificate. And then uh, the clients, overwhelmingly, perhaps don't need to use any GitHub specific tooling, and there's no modifications to their workflows. Um, if 
you don't, uh, and, and you know, the repository receives the certificate and embeds that within the RSL and all of that. Uh, but the other things we want to do in parallel, as Billy mentioned earlier, is also more just like the CI/CD as aspect of automating some of this, right? Uh, you got uh, you got a contribution from a new new you know previously unseen person via a pull request or something, but it's we build in automations to uh, we build in the automation to capture additional information about what's happening there and how you know the trusted users uh, approve it and then record perhaps that action as an Intoto attestation, something that could also really tie in well with like the salsa source track work. And uh, that's 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 kind of like yeah, the different battle of tracks I see. Yeah, so another thing that we're thinking about in terms of like ease ease of use for like immediate adoption are things like if we have a GitHub app or a GitHub action that just, you know, does the observation of, hey, like this person doesn't have Git Tough enabled, but like we're just going to create an attestation as the identity of that app. It may not be as secure as if that person did it themselves, but we'll at least have some metadata to say like, okay, we observed this GitHub user at this time. Uh, and even on the reviewer side as well, we can say like, oh, this GitHub user approved this PR at this time, but that metadata would then be contained in the repo. Um, yeah, the, the untrusted user, like the first time maintainer, like we, we can paper over some of the metadata stuff um, in terms of like, I don't know if your question was going into like user trust and like how do we trust new maintainers? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, so my, my hope there is if we uh, start with the CI approach of like we could start recording some metadata uh, and then if that's like a, a check that can show up in your like repository, that can then become a required check. Um, and so again, even though it's not like the individual user identities directly, we still have some metadata. Some metadata is better than none and that's sort of like you know how I see that journey from nothing to everyone's actually self-signing everything and, and doing everything themselves. We can sort of meet them where they are and, and guide them along the way. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully CI automation, stuff like that. Uh, we have a similar problem with like Git sign because like, you know, GitHub still doesn't trust the, uh, the six store route for commit signatures. Uh, but we've seen people like uh, write GitHub apps that do the verification and that show up as like a green check mark in the CI per, per pull request per commit. So that ends up usually being pretty effective as like a first getting started point.